This is the Ray Carr Show. Our special guest on the telephone line with me right now, a member, former member of Joy D and the Starlighters, uh, David Brigatti. David, how you doing? Good morning, everyone. David, great to have you on the show today. Tell me a little bit about your um, your role in Joy D and the Starlighters. Well, at a very young age, I loved seeing harmony, and I had graduated from a group called the High Fives, which was a kind of an a cappella group on the Decca record label. And I was recruited sort of, uh, uh, well, we asked Joey D to sing with us as well uh, to record first. And we became friends uh, through various high school things. He was from Passaic, New Jersey, and I was from a neighboring town called Garfield. And I was asked to join him after I left a job that didn't want to promote me. <laughs> Wow, really? So they didn't want to promote yes. you? Wow. It's a long story. I have many short stories written about all this, and uh, I guess it, they're to be discovered some other time. Yeah, yeah. But uh, being with the Starlighters, that opened up a lot of doors for you, right? Yes, it did. Uh, we had a fabulous opportunity at the Peppermint Lounge in New York City to meet many, many, many famous people and uh, grand connections. What was that like for those of us that have never been to New York or never experienced that nightclub scene back in the early 1960s? Talk about the environment, the the ambience. What was it all like being in a peppermint lounge and, and the people that would go in and out of there? Well, it was a very small um, lounge around 200 and Ten people uh, in the hotel Knickerbocker on West Forty Fifth Street, right in the heart of the uh, theater zone. You know, yeah. And um, we were attracting many people, and suddenly uh, an actress named Merle Oberon uh, came in, and uh, and a writer Earl Wilson and Charlie Knickerbocker, who was uh, Oleg Cassini's brother. Uh, wrote about Merle Oberon. Uh, she walked in with a Russian prince who was the last of the, uh, the Tsar's family before communism took over. It was written, and the next night it was police on horses, you know, and the crowds just built up and, and to, down to Broadway. Was it just the peppermint twist that attracted people there? Or was it was there just a, the whole the, the whole set of his music that got him there? Well, with the peppermint twist had to be invented. Yeah, because of this, uh, it was we were playing all kinds of uh, blues. We had a we had a mixed group, uh, and we were playing all kinds of early rock and roll. Uh, people like Judy Garland came down to discover this new music. To her, it was very new. And uh, and other people just came down to dance. We were already doing um, our version of uh, a famous twist dance, you know? Right. And then we had to write about it, and then we had to match the music to what we were doing. It was more upbeat, though. It had more of a an intense rhythm to it than the regular twist. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, we, I have to thank two great musicians, uh, Carl Lattimore, originally from Gainesville, Florida, on, on uh, the organ, and uh, Willie Davis from Savannah, Georgia, who were tremendous musicians, uh, and they, they carried us, you know. So they were the they were the catalyst behind that great sound of Joey D and the Starlighters. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. And then we were fortunate enough to have other people who replaced uh, them, kind of in and out and back and forth. And uh, we had a great choreography going. And then we added a guitar to it. Uh, a fellow named Sam Taylor, whose father was a famous. Uh, Sam the Man Taylor, saxophonist, who played on many, many hit records in those days. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, we had a, an excellent choreography. And I, I must say, we, we sang.
song, Good Harmony, that was a big key to uh, being able to sing any kind of music. We sang some standards, but mostly we sang early rock and roll. Early, yeah, and that's that's what you sound. Yeah, you sounded yeah. great doing that stuff. Uh, David Bugardi, our, our David Bugardi, our special guest. Uh, David, no, another question. After Joey D and the Starlighters, tell me what happened with your career after that. Oh well, I began to uh, have a struggle with the United States Army at the Vietnam situation. You know, okay, I sure. did not want to go because I had traveled the world. I felt I did my duty. We did many, many charities and benefits and things like that. And I felt that I had served my country enough. And I um, I struggled with that. And I kind of left uh, the Joey D situation for a while. And my younger brother, Eddie Brigatti, and some of the early rascals joined Joey D. And they began to to play uh, locally and some uh, traveling too. And I I naturally began to sing with them, and we started to record. And the Rascals got very lucky with a song called "Good Lovin'." Yeah, reached number one. And they began to understand early rock and roll rhythm and blues. And we uh, we naturally gravitated to harmony singing, which I think was a a big part of making some nice records. You know, beautiful records. I mean, Good Lovin' was a great uh, upbeat dance song, and it was uh, it's oh, still yeah. still being played today. It is. It'll it'll always be played. It's, it's exciting, and it personifies what pop music and rock and roll really mean. You know, I other than. Uh, uh, I don't understand rap and hip hop. Uh, I mean, I'm not in love with it. We'll put it that way. Well, I'm right there with you, my friend. I, I have to do it on some mobile DJ gigs that I have to play. But believe me, my heart and soul. Why? <laughs> well, I people want to hear that stuff, but but my heart and soul lies within the 1950s and 60s, and I, that's really where my desire, and that's the music that I play on this show, all comes from that. So, and you I know, think so. It included love. And great rhythm and and uh, chord arrangements and things like that. It made it kind of made sense. And I don't want to sound like an old fogey about this, but it made more sense than what, what I'm hearing on the radio today. Well, in my opinion, I shouldn't say this, but it, I, I feel that the, on, on the radio today really isn't music anymore. It's just noise. Yeah, it's kind. Of, it's a, it's entertaining. It is exciting. I must say, but it goes along with the bombs away feeling, and I, I, I think it has nothing to do with the good storytelling and great singing and great playing. Absolutely, David. David, we're going to take a little momentary break. We'll be right back in about two minutes, so hang hang with us, all right? Uh, yes, sir. Hold on, we'll be right back. I want you, baby. I'll say I want you just to dance with me. Come on and dance, yeah, dance, yeah, dance, yeah, dance, you got to dance, if you love me, you got to dance, place no one above me, you got to dance, I just to please me, you got to dance, baby, don't you tease me, look, I saw a fella swing you around the floor. David, I wanted to play a little bit of this song here called Dance, Dance, Dance. Did you play on this song? No, I didn't. Um, I was busy fighting the uh, civilian uh, army. <laughs> okay, I understand. I understand. Um, but a lot of songs that Joey D and the Starlighters did were upbeat. Those songs that you just hear, now, even if they were cover versions, they were th- probably better than the original in most cases. Well, we we had the the, the foresight, uh, not the foresight, the the luck, I should say to have those to copy with and then of course to improve upon them right you know it's one thing to uh, to invent something and then it's another thing to improve upon something 
Well, you have to have the talent in which to do that, and obviously the talent was certainly there. And uh, that you... was lucky. That was, I, I consider that lucky to bump into people of like talent and then get it together. Chemistry, basically, what it is. Yeah, is I call it a gift. You know. Yeah. What were some of the, your your most uh, famous and most enjoyable songs that you wrote over the years that you'd like to share with us? Oh wow! Well, my my biggest pride, uh, probably with the Rascals, was uh, having very much to do with the many of the lyrics and the melody on a song called "How Can I Be Sure." Right, and that was heavily covered by, uh, uh, for instance, Johnny Mathis. I just found out last year Johnny Mathis recorded how can i be sure in 1972 and i had no way of knowing that you know you know uh david let me play a little bit of that for our audience right now we'll come right back to the conversation but just let me uh, just break away here we'll play a little bit of this uh how can i be sure and then we'll talk a little bit more about it how can i be sure in a world that's constantly changing how can i David, a great song, and it just ebbs and flows with energy. Yes, it's magical. It also includes legitimate music. We, we grew up in a very musical house. I mean, we had a radio. We had no money, but we had a radio. <laughs> and uh, my mother also loved to sing, and I guess we uh, borrowed her ear. And um, I had a few aunts, uh, my, my mother's siblings, who used to sing, and they loved to do it, and I grew up in a musical house, you know? And I noticed in that song, it sounds like there's music of Italy in there. Well, I, I would say uh, we, were, we could never separate our, our background yeah. from uh, what we were learning uh, in those days. Well, I, it's legitimate. I borrowed from... Uh, the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s when I uh, conjured that up. But that, those lyrics were written in 45 minutes. Wow, and they're great lyrics. And it almost the, the feeling of the song has almost a mazurka feel to it, you know, like a, an Italian polka. And it just, but yet it's still rock and roll, and it's still a yeah, very... They, they, they argued with the record company, argued with us about the, the, the syncopation, the beat. It was like 6-8 feel, and they didn't want to... Uh, uh, invade rock and roll with that, you know. But I said, uh, as I once said with um, the great Roberta Flack, when her song Killing Me Softly was played, I said, well, that'll never be a hit because it's beyond the market. And it changed the market, is what it did. Some songs do that. And, you know, there's like there's the song El Paso by Marty Robbins was one of those songs that was longer than the typical 45 was during the 50s. Yes, he was one of my favorites. He used to come to the Peppermint Lounge, and he followed us down to South Jersey and all. He was studying rock and roll. All of his friends ridiculed him about that. He never quite wrote a rock and roll hit, but he was a great fan. He knew that there was more uh, to the world than just his southern or cowboy music, you know? Yeah, he was he he was able to see the entire picture and see what yes, he was a wonderful friend. I didn't know who he really was. He was just always there. We went out to eat, we we hung around, and I didn't know who he really was. He was a very humble soul. Who were some other musicians of that ilk that you would hang out with and just you know have conversations about life with? Oh wow, we had immediately upon the, the fame of uh, the Peppermint Lounge, uh, Cab Calloway, and Lionel Hampton visited the lounge, and I wrote about them because uh, they knew through the newspapers and all the publicity that something was happening, uh, and something did happen earlier in, in the United States and New York uh, at the Cotton Club. It became very famous through publicity and the the uh, quality of the music they were playing at the time. And I knew and they knew that something big was happening to the newspapers, you know. 
Absolutely, and it was the New York, the New York uh, Sunday Mirror, I think, at the time, which probably became the Daily News or something like that. You know, right? I'm right. I'm, I'm mixed up about that because it's ancient history. You know, sure, it's hard to remember sometimes. David Bergardi, yes. our special guest. David, um, are you are you going to publish any of these writings that you've compiled? Well, I'm hoping to. Uh, uh, if I wrote a book, it would be 10 feet tall, so I can't call it a book. I think I might do an oral uh, reading of all these things, and then maybe it'll it'll come out in some type of... Uh, Paperback. Uh, oratory uh, yeah. product, you know. I'm not really sure. Right now I'm swamped with memorabilia. I'm putting everything on an external hard drive. I'm getting a lot of help from different relatives and friends. And I'm just swamped with with uh, memorabilia, you know? Yeah, understandable. I don't know what to do with it all. I, I mean, there's got to be a I, lot if of If you send it to a museum, uh, we could only support a museum for a certain amount of years, and then it'll just disappear. I don't want to sell it or destroy it. I just... Uh, there's wanna... no guarantee of uh, anything remaining except the pyramids, you know? Right. You want to share it with everybody that would enjoy that. Yes, I do. It's important. I have so many, so many people uh, to tell stories about. We have Don Rickles, we have Smokey Robinson, uh, uh, Andy Warhol, for instance. Uh, Jimi Hendrix also played with us for a while. What was that like? We discovered him. He was, he had no money. He had a guitar with no amplifier and no cord. You know. What, what, what David? When was this? This was in the. Uh, Sixty-four-ish area. Okay, sixty-four. Area. So, so Hendrix out of um, he's out of the Pacific Northwest. Probably, I think it's Washington State. And Seattle. He, no, no, he actually was Oregon, I believe. And he comes to New York, and he has nothing. And you guys kind of take him in. You saw the talent there, right? Yeah. Well, he was introduced to us by a drummer that we had picked up uh, from Chicago. Uh, his name was uh, Jimmy Mays, and he introduced. With no rehearsal, he came with us on the road. We, we played in Syracuse and uh, New York State area, and he fit right in. He was humble, very quiet, a beautiful person. Uh, he had his fame burst out after a visit to uh, England, and I think he had a little help from uh, LSD. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. Perhaps. Yeah, I mean. he became very wild, and that was not his persona. He was a paratrooper in the Air Force. He a uh, very quiet and humble person. Yeah, I've heard that story about him. Uh, but, if, yes. uh, David, very interesting, and uh, I want to thank you for being a guest on the Ray Carr Show. Before we let you leave, though, I'd like you to, yes. do, a, I'd like you to do a promo for my show and just say, the, say your name, and you're listening to the Ray Carr Show on WCSB Cleveland. Can you do that for me? The WCSB, I have to write this down. Yeah, write that down, because we want to be able to play it at you know, different shows and uh, be able to let people know who you are. Yeah, I'll preface it with Joey the Installers and the Young Rascals. Yes. I From heard. W. Cleveland. Yes. Ray Carr Show, is that how you want that? That's perfect. That's perfect. Just so our listeners know who we're speaking with. Okay. Shall I start? Yes, sir. Oh. Hi, folks. This is Dave Brigatti from New Jersey. And formerly of Joey D and the Starlighters with the famous Peppermint Lounge and the Young Rascals wishing Ray Carr of WCSB Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you, David. I thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Is that okay? I don't know. No. I stuttered and hammered. No, no. Hammered. With the miracle of, of radio editing, we can make that sound perfect. <laughs> Oh, terrific. Yeah. What about that horn? Leave that horn out. All right, we'll leave the horn out. No problem. David, thank no, you. I'm I know you are. Uh, thank you so much, sir. We'll be in touch, and uh, I wish you the best. Good. Call me. All my love to everyone. I, I certainly will, sir. Have a good day. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. David Brigatti.